Yeah, we uh, kind of went over uh, about the fourth page there. Art, did you have a chance to kind of glance? Well, I kind of looked at it a little bit. Sort of the sequence. Sir, uh, just a bit on personal information. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. And then education. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. If you just uh, want to look at those bolded headings for uh, just an instant. Yeah, see, this is probably we... something we should have. I should have had to drop off with you last week. So you Art's oh, better yeah. at these things yeah. without them anyway. <laughs> is he, that right? he really is good. And when the pressure is on, answer? Art can kind of. <laughs> Come on, now, don't, don't build it up like that. That's a, <laughs> that's a bad way to start. Oh, no. Kirk Blaze and Paris Maiden. Okay. We may, we may have to come back and do you another time. Never. <laughs> <laughs> I'm better in the background. What job did you have as a child? I think you're under face now. So I answered yes. <laughs> well, aren't you? They're looking at it to be more. You know, we'll, yeah. We'll prompt you with more yeah. of a monologue type. Okay, sure. If you, if you want to link that or something on yeah. that particular thing. Like and if he talks too much, you can almost take a, cut a little piece out if <laughs> you don't like it, right? Can't you? Yeah. I mean, is that the way? You can edit them. Oh, yeah. Just to suit your needs. Let's see. Zoom is right here. Yeah, I had... Uh, I had two two funny phone calls. One, well, I better not get started. You're just probably. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the gist of them was that uh, they were entirely separate. They weren't even in the same state, and they wondered what did I. Uh, the questions had to do with uh, with something. One was in 1933, and the other is 1934. And uh, they were writing an article or something, and and they knew I'd been involved in some way, and they had some question, and so they called. They, they, they just both happened to call the same, almost the same week, didn't they? It almost, a, mm -hmm. and that was a. So I had to rack my brain to see what the heck I, how that could be, but it turned out to be quite interesting. All right. I'm going to run out of coffee before we <laughs> get started here. You better send Dan out a, a, an hour or two before you arrive. Yeah, well, we're, this is just this is kind of our our <laughs> practice run here and see how we're going to. I think I'm going to have to work the city here and see if I. Can. <laughs> My hopes is to get Bill Longley, do him, and then get him to help since he. Oh yeah. He knows a lot of the people, uh -huh. but there's a still a pretty That'd good group That'd be nice for, I'm sure Bill would find it very Yeah, because he yeah, likes the history stuff. Yeah. You know, and then, because, you know, with him and Harvey and Goody and Dave Vassell over in Stillwater, you know, some of the people at the U that are mm -hmm. still around. Yeah. Well, let's see here. Push on. <laughs> All of a sudden, it uh, the screen blanked out. I was just monkeying with this up here. Let's see. Looking good there for a minute. Should be plenty of juice in the battery. Um. Okay, now I think we're. Will you be referring to this uh, this list of things that occasionally, if I 
they've come to one and I, I skip them. Yeah. Something we'll, like that. And then okay. we'll, we'll chat notes if it looks like there might be, you know, what you say is worth another question. You guys can uh, go ahead and begin. Okay. Well, this is an interview with Art Hawkins on 17 June 2000 as part of the, I get the right term here, celebrating our wildlife heritage, wildlife conservation heritage project. Art, I guess I'd like to start with just some, some background on kind of your personal history as far as where you're born and when, where you grew up, some information on that sort. Well, I was, uh, I was born in Batavia, New York, um, which is between Buffalo and Rochester. Uh, and um, actually, my birthday was only two days ago, June 15th, 1913. Uh, my parents' uh, names were the same as mine, Arthur, it was my dad. And my mother's name was Olive, her last name was Prescott. Uh, they, my dad was born in England, and he came over to this country when he was about eight years old, and uh, uh, promptly settled in, uh, or, uh, at Batavia, I believe it was, uh, and uh, so I spent uh, most of my early life in that area. We lived in town, but very close to the edge of it at that time. It was very, it was just uh, in the early stages of development, and. Uh, so we lived near enough the edge of it that I could get out to get out of town uh, pretty rapidly to hunt fish or whatever I wanted to do. Uh, one thing that um, most people nowadays wouldn't understand is that we never owned a car. We didn't need to in those days. Uh, the uh, grocery stores were always handy. You could walk to them and so on. And uh, uh, my um, uh, my early job was uh, as a newsboy. We had a, uh, my brother and I had uh, uh, delivered newspapers, uh, uh, David Daily News and Rochester and Buffalo papers. Uh, uh, that's how we made our early money. And uh, uh, after he um, got up to be a senior and on the football team and so on, uh, he turned over his paper route to me, and so uh, that's. That's what I did in my early days, and uh, spent an awful lot of time uh, when I wasn't delivering papers um, out in the field hunting or fishing or something of that sort. We, I remember uh, on one occasion, uh, one of my customers uh, mentioned to me that um, they'd seen some birds, funny-looking birds, out in their backyard with long bills, and uh, well, by that time I had uh, knew enough about birds that I put two and two together and figured that was uh, must be a woodcock. And, uh, so my earliest hunting, was, was some of my earliest hunting was with woodcock. Uh, the, um, uh, at an early age, uh, I, I obtained a, a bird dog, a pointer, and uh, so my pointer and I spent a lot of time uh, hunting together with, with a couple of my friends that were hunting partners, and uh, we spent I'd say all of our spare time uh, hunting and fishing uh, where you could get mostly with a bicycle. That was uh, our means of transportation to most of our areas and luckily we had some places where, uh, where we could get trout or bass or whatever uh, within easy biking distance. And, and uh, I used to be able to set up a, a camp um, as soon as school was out, I set up a tent out near this place that I fished, and, uh, and it, uh, after doing the papers in the evening, uh, we'd run out and usually camp there, and get a little fishing, and then uh, get back to town the next day in time to run the paper route. So that was pretty much the routine at that time. And, uh, so. Well, one of the uh, important things that happened to me as a, as a newsboy, uh, one of my customers was uh, turned out to be a, a, a typical little old lady in tennis suit shoes type of birder. And uh, uh, so we 
whenever I'd go there for collecting for the paper or something, uh, she'd get out her bird book and, uh, and uh, tell me about birds, and I got interested in it. And, uh, and uh, she told me that the what to get is a bird guide, which is one of these pocket-sized reed bird guides. And uh, I remember my mother uh, got me a pair of uh, binoculars uh, to start out with my birding. Only they weren't uh, there. I think they were two two power um, opera glasses. I think what is what they were to start with. Uh, but uh, I recall that I. I got into a, a, a migration of warblers one time, and by that time I had my two powers in my bird book, and uh, it was one of these uh, migrations where you get a whole lot of warblers in one tree at one time, and I remember just uh, um, standing there looking through my bird book, identifying these warblers, and I, I think I must have learned uh, at least a half a dozen or so on that very first trip, and that got me kind of uh, into, into birding in a big way because I, I had, uh, hadn't realized that um, birds were that pretty, I guess, and uh, so that, that uh, really, she really got me started in my interest in, uh, in songbirds. Uh, most of the interest in hunting and fishing was pretty much uh, on my own and, and uh, was uh, with friends that liked uh, that sort of thing. Uh, my dad was not a hunter or fisherman, either one. Uh, my mother was quite tolerant of me bringing home game and cooking it up for me. Uh, but uh, my brother, I have one brother, and he he also was uh, was neither hunter or fisher. And uh, so this was pretty much something I think that I got from my grandfather. He was the one who bought me my first. Uh, my first shotgun, which was a single barrel of fever, 30 inch barrels, full choke. And I remember my first woodcock hunting was uh, with uh, the shells that I had, which I, I remember were number four shots. So uh, anyway, I wasn't, uh, at that point I was uh, just at the very beginning. And so anyway, uh, and uh, the, the uh, uh, Trout fishing was reasonably good. There were places that I could get trout very close in, so that's where I picked up fishing with a fly rod. And got, you know, a good friend of mine was a taxidermist, and, uh, and he is the one that really got me started into the more sophisticated type of fishing, such as using flies and uh, things of that sort. He, uh, he uh, took me on a on uh, trips with him, uh, he, he did have a uh, car, which made it uh, uh, made us possible to range out a little bit more than we could with a bicycle. And so we visited the, some of the better spots after that. And, and he, he, he uh, taught me some of the fine points of hunting, fishing, and trapping. And I recall that my after my first year in college, uh, the uh, uh, during the Christmas vacation, we spent from the full-time uh, trapping for muskrats at that year, and uh, uh, I recall that I think they averaged something like uh, 35 cents a piece. It was, right, it was right during the Depression years, and and uh, what 35 cents was uh, meant a lot more than it does nowadays. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess one of my very first jobs was uh, there was a requirement after I went to Cornell. Uh, at Stony, I was uh, I was interested in some sort of a career that would take you out of doors, and uh, forestry was the one that uh, sounded the, like the best bet. So I uh, went to Cornell because they had a forestry school there, and uh, um, one of the requirements was that you spend the summer, the first summer in some sort of a, a job related to forestry or outdoors of some sort. At that time, because of the deep depression, uh, these, these even summer jobs were hard to come by. And uh, the, the only place I could get located was a, a local uh, game club that had a place where they raised trout and planted trees and uh, things of that sort. And uh, so I, I uh, I uh, worked there most of the summer, uh, feeding liver to trout and 
doing some stream improvement work and uh, uh, planting quite a number of trees. Uh, uh, anyway, that was, uh, but I, I didn't get, uh, they couldn't afford to pay me anything. And, uh, but I needed to do that to get my credit for summer work. And, uh, but at the end of it, they, uh, uh, they gave me, uh, presented me with an Ithaca shotgun. So that was my summer's pay for, for working for them. Um, so what years were you at Cornell? Uh, I started out in 31, 1931. And, uh, I uh, started out in forestry, and um, uh, the second year that I was in forestry, the forestry school pulled out of Cornell and moved to Syracuse. And uh, so I had to make a decision whether to follow them to Syracuse or to um, um, uh, change my coursework a little bit. And, uh, so what I did was to uh, get into, I took all the courses in outdoor biology that they had there. Uh, they had a, it, it turned out that, uh, that uh, Cornell had probably the best best program in the country at that time and uh, a mix of herpetology and uh, ichthyology and, and so on and uh, mammalogy particularly with uh, Dr. Bill Hamilton and uh, uh, ichthyology was uh, Dr. Rambody and uh, ornithology was Dr. Allen, and all of them were famous people in their in their field, and so I took all of their courses and my and uh, graduated with a, a degree in uh, in biology, uh, uh, field biology. Was, uh, they also had uh, uh, the, the other type of biology, the indoor type of biology, but the two groups hardly ever spoke to each other. <laughs> they they uh, the uh, uh, the lab biologists uh, really didn't think too much of the field biologists in those days. And, but um, anyway, in my, uh, I graduated in 34. Uh, one of my jobs while I was at the U there was to work with the, uh, uh, the grouse survey uh, being conducted by Dr. Bump and uh, uh, others uh, was in progress at that time. This was the first of, of several important game management uh, research projects. Uh, there, um, there was one on quail going at the, at the same time, or right around that time. But the, the grouse and the quail, I think, were two of the, the very first of the really major research projects going on. And so I had the benefit of, uh, of uh, working on that program in my spare time while I was going to school. and. Um, then in, um, in 34, uh, when I graduated, uh, I worked for the um, uh, New York State uh, um, uh, Conservation Department in those days on the Stream, stream and Lake Survey uh, under Dr. Emmeline Moore, which was a very unusual thing. Uh, in those days, uh, women very seldom had leadership roles of, of that type. and. Uh, so this was a very unusual one. Uh, this was a, a study of all the uh, major lakes and or, well, watersheds of, of New York State uh, with reference to the uh, streams and the ponds and so on. And I worked on the stream survey part of it in the Mohawk Hudson watershed, and uh, which was, uh, and some of our work was at the edge of the Adirondacks. We, we, so we had some experience in the that area. I, I, another uh, job related uh, or career related uh, job that I had about that time in the summer of uh, 1933 I worked uh, in, uh, in Pennsylvania in, in uh, northwestern Pennsylvania at the Tyanestas uh, forest which was a, a virgin Oops, Time out. <laughs> Go on. Okay. <laughs> what what happened there? Yeah, I think it just. Betty, did you breathe too hard there or something? <laughs> I don't think so. Can you widen the, the legs on the bottom there? Well, give us a chance. Okay. Is, this, is this getting too detailed or? No, no, this, <laughs> this is great. good. 
I love oh. it myself. <laughs> well, as you were. Yep. Okay. <laughs> oh well, are we back on track? Yeah, we're back. Yeah, you were working in Pennsylvania. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, this turned out to be the um, uh, one of the first of the areas that uh, that was acquired by the state as a as a scientific and natural area. I believe it was one of the first and. Uh, it, it um, was much reduced in size from the, the original concept, but that was understandable. And uh, 1934 was uh, just about the depth of the depression, and for any outfit to get money for anything was was uh, rather unusual. And uh, so I was able to to work that summer uh, on this biological survey, which included. A little of everything plants and fauna and flora both of the Tainesta forest and that resulted in the, uh, the first publication that had my name on it I guess was, uh, was that the result of that and uh, but uh, to get back to um, uh, Cornell after graduation uh, and working with the state on the watershed I uh, decided to <coughs> go back to school on a master's program in fisheries at that time and uh, so I, uh, I uh, my major professor in that was Dr. Embody in, in fisheries and uh, um, my, my subject was that I was going to do a life history of the fantail darter was what I started out to work on but uh, it got uh, more and more apparent as I went along that the uh, the road at that time, I, I wanted to go into research, and the road was in the fish hatcheries. Of course, you could do a fit research in fish hatcheries, but I didn't want an indoor type job. And uh, so, uh, when uh, uh, long toward the end of the first semester, uh, I was called into um, Dr. Allen's office. He was the ornithologist office that I'd done a lot of work under, and he said that there are two two openings that have just come to, come to me that, uh, and I thought you might be interested in one of them. And um, uh, one was to go to Wisconsin to study under all the Leopold, and uh, the other was to work for the Audubon Society uh, on the Ivoryville Woodpecker. And um, there were two of us that he called into the office, and the, the other fellow was ahead of me, and that he uh, had been working on his PhD. And I, his name was Jim Tanner, and um, and he was uh, he was a dyed in the wool ornithologist. I mean, he was an old type, of really into ornithology in a big way. And he he chose the uh, ivory bill job, and that left the other open to me. So I applied for the second one, which was go to Wisconsin under Leopold. And uh, at that point, I think I had heard of Leopold, but I had no idea anything about him. But anyway, it sounded like it was uh, along the lines that I was interested in getting into the game work. And uh, so anyway, I, I took a flyer at it and went out there and, uh, and so became Leopold's third student. He already had uh, uh, a fellow named Leonard Wing and, uh, and Franklin Schmidt uh, were already uh, uh, signed up as his students. This was in 1935, which was only a year after, after he got his, uh, after Leopold was, was named the first uh, chair of game management in the country. And uh, he had, by that time, he'd completed his book, Game Management. And uh, uh, so anyway, there, there were the three of us as students, one secretary and so on. And uh, so I, um, I, uh, appeared in uh, his office in Wisconsin on January 2nd, 1935. And uh, I uh, always remember that first day of acquaintance with Leopold. Uh, I, uh, of course, had misgivings. Here, here I was way out in Wisconsin, which was uh, far west of any place I'd ever been in my life. And, uh, and I, I, I probably envisioned uh, maybe Indians running around and buffalo and things of that sort, you know. And uh, 
But anyway, when I, I, I um, when he ushered me into his office, uh, he greeted me like a like an old friend, and uh, and we talked uh, informally the rest of the morning. He had his desk all cleared, and he told his secretary not to allow any phone interruption or anything like that. And uh, so we talked all morning. I got to be uh, lunchtime, and he said he'd like to have me come out to the house to meet his family. So. So uh, I, uh, I thought we'd go out and jump in the car because he lived about a mile from the, from the office. But, but no, he didn't have his car there. We walked to his place and that was his way of uh, 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 get his exercise for the day. He'd walk back and forth to the office and, at noon, then in the afternoon, and same thing. And uh, so anyway, that's, uh, uh, we went to his home and uh, I think his, uh, Nina and Estella were there, but I don't think the boys were. I think the Starker and uh, Luna were off somewhere. And uh, T Starker was the same age as I am, and uh, he was uh, he was in college. He just started. Uh, he was at, at the University of Wisconsin at the time, and uh, uh, so anyway, I met uh, a couple of the family members and Mrs. Leopold, and they were. They were, of course, all very nice, and uh, and he excused himself after lunch and for a short nap. And uh, he uh, it turned out that that was a daily routine. He uh, and I realized afterwards why he had that routine because he used to go to the office uh, very early in the morning, and he'd do all his uh, outside work and that he had to do on a, on a national scale. You know, or writing and that sort of thing he'd do before the day started at the office and uh, when you go into his office at a meeting or something his desk would be cleared and uh, and you were the you were the most important person there uh, he didn't he didn't interrupt it with a lot of things going on at the same time with phone calls and and uh, things of that nature he just uh, uh, spent the whole day with you as though you, your project was the most important one uh, going on at the time. And uh, and that was his um, way of doing business uh, all through the time that I knew him. And uh, So anyway, that, that was how I got my start. And uh, my job at the time was to work on quail. There was um, there been an explosion of uh, eruption, they called it, uh, of quail in Wisconsin and they'd spread into areas where they normally didn't uh, occur far north of their normal range after a series of mild winters and uh, so anyway they uh, and I was supposed to set up some study areas and kind of follow through on what happened uh, when conditions changed. Well unfortunately they, uh, they changed right off the bat and by the time I started to collect data they'd already gone in the in the downslide, and uh, so um, I, I set up my study areas, and uh, I had five of them scattered around the state. One of them was at Coon Valley, where uh, there was quite a bit of uh, information being gathered because uh, Coon Valley was the first of the SES, uh, uh, Soil Erosion Service, in those days. Um, th this was a, a national experiment, and in Coon Valley was the first one in which they were trying to uh, get all the different agencies, uh, land use agencies, working together on projects. There'd be uh, work on wildlife and uh, soil erosion and, and various cropping systems and so on. It was all going on in this one place as, a, as an experiment. And uh, uh, so they had some data already on quail from the previous year. So that was one of the reasons I chose that area, and then I had uh, other areas, one of which was at Fable Grove in, uh, near Madison, and uh, and that's that's where, uh, this is another part of the story, but uh, that's where I met Betty, Betty was uh, her grandfather, whose picture is right here, uh, was um, a friend, of, a close friend of uh, Aldo Leopold, or became a close friend, and he helped organize a group of farmers into a, a cooperative arrangement between game management and farm operations to see 
if the two could be brought together. This was a, a one of Leopold's big things was uh, the idea of, of, of cooperation between farmers and sportsmen and, and uh, uh, the wildlife uh, ex, uh, people that were specializing in wildlife uh, working together toward uh, a more interesting relationship on the land itself and uh, to see if it would work. And so anyway, after the quail project fell through because the conditions had changed, um, I, I became the manager of this area and so I actually moved out there and lived on the area and many of his students that followed me were funneled through that area as part of their field training. He believed uh, strongly in, in getting his field people out in the field and, and uh, he felt that that was as important a part of their education as what they got out of the books at the, in the classroom. And so, uh, so I, uh, I worked out of Fable Grove the rest of my stay in, in uh, Wisconsin and then would go to, uh, got my classwork out of work uh, during the winter going into Madison from this was only 25 miles uh, from, from Madison, and so that worked out very well. And uh, um, but, uh, so anyway, that uh, that uh, uh, that's where I got my field experience under Leopold. Um, and after I obtained my degree from Wisconsin. Um, my first job was with the Illinois Natural History Survey and um, I spent uh, four years there um, in, uh, in charge of a section called Wildlife um, Experimental Areas and uh, it wasn't a very big section at the time I went down there. Uh, uh, Frank Belrose was my, the only other person on the section and I was, so it started out uh, as a new section and. So Belrose and I worked together uh, closely on in this uh, this area, and uh, that's where our we got where I got strongly involved in waterfowl management. Uh, Frank was very much interested in, the, in wood ducks, right? From the even at that early stage, and uh, so we uh, decided to establish our headquarters at Havana, Illinois, on the Illinois River and worked out of there from then on. And uh, uh, Frank, um, uh, well, we, we got into uh, waterfowl management in various ways, not only in the wood ducks, but uh, there had not been a, a real study of, uh, of waterfowl and, and as to the, uh, well, the, the uh, population aspects of it, the uh, refuge and feeding and all that sort of thing and uh, or the uh, no effort had been made to appraise the effect of hunting on uh, waterfowl. So we got into a kind of a uh, waterfowl in general and uh, we worked closely with Della uh, Waterfowl Research uh, Station in that, uh, in that way that uh, the uh, one of the, my associates at, um, at Wisconsin at Ben Al Hochbaum and uh, I also had known Al uh, when I was at Cornell. He, he was at Cornell at the same time I was and I recall that I met him on a, I was out grouse hunting one time and ran into him out in the field and that was my first uh, meeting with him and from then on uh, we our paths crossed quite frequently and uh, and then when he moved to Delta and took over the Delta Research Station, uh, his station was one of the first to discover how to age ducks uh, and uh, so we tied that into our studies down in, in Illinois and for the first time we started to gather uh, measurements of productivity in, in ducks uh, through a, a method that was uh, was reliable in, in, age, in determining uh, uh, age and sex. Uh, and so this was where that type of information really got its start. And then we branched out and started to gather information all down the flyway. And, and uh, 
So let's see. After um, my fourth, about my fourth year in um, Illinois Natural History Survey, uh, the, the military caught up with me. It was uh, and uh, I was uh, inducted and uh, spent some time at uh, Camp Grant in the veterinary service. Uh, at that time, uh, people in biology had uh, uh, their what they call MOUs, really. The, or the, the, uh, you were either classified as uh, in veterinary service or in sanitary service. And uh, so they put me into veterinary service. I had taken one course in veterinary at Cornell. I think that was the reason they did that. Yeah, and, uh, and at that time, the training center was at Camp Grant, and I was in the last class that trained, trained as a field aid station for horses. And so we went through a whole course of learning all about horses and how to manage them up and all that sort of thing. And then, then uh, by that time, the war had gotten around to the point where they decided that horses were no longer part of the deal. And so from then on, it was a strictly food inspection type of activity. And uh, so we, uh, they, they shipped us to various points around the country that uh, uh, my first uh, field or uh, movement was to Shepherd's Field in Wichita Falls, Texas. And, uh, the, um, and then after that, I went to Amarillo and I spent most of the rest of the war working out of uh, Amarillo developing a, a milk shed and uh, uh, their Amarillo field was the uh, uh, center for a whole bunch of other posts around there and uh, uh, so the, the real problem was uh, fluid milk and uh, so they tried to train the ranchers around there to become uh, 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 food or milk producers that could be used to meeting army standards and that was a that was a tough thing to do because they, they didn't have facilities, they didn't have the type of cows, uh, that uh, they didn't know how to take care of their equipment and uh, so I, uh, my job was to uh, work out in the field uh, trying to develop this milk shed and we, we, we spread over five states actually uh, getting the milk shed developed. We were up into Colorado and Oklahoma and New Mexico and, and I had her work over a big area and in doing so I got to travel a lot and uh, I got on many farms and uh, with my background I, I couldn't help but keep bird notes as I was getting around. As a matter of fact uh, there was uh, the editor of the paper in Amarillo was, uh, was a big uh, um, DU person and uh, well that time, I guess he was in his early stages. But uh, anyway, he was very—he had a ranch, and he was very much interested in, in introducing Hungarian partridge to the Texas Panhandle. And uh, and one of the jobs I'd done at Wisconsin was to work uh, with uh, Bob McCabe on uh, Hungarian partridge, and and he got wind of that somehow, and uh, so he asked me to help uh, introduce uh, Hungarians. And uh, so it, uh, he was going to get some birds from Alberta, I believe, bring them in. He had this all arranged ahead of time. And so I tried to pick an area that came as close to Alberta as I could, <laughs> could find, which was, uh, and there was some country there that was quite similar in lots of way, wheat country. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, dry, it was a dry country. And uh, on there, Burford, Texas turned out to be a pretty good place to her release, I thought, and so that, that's where they, they made their releases, was right around this, this place, and uh, actually uh, uh, some of the birds did survive and produce broods there, and, uh, but then it finally faded out little by little. I, as far as I know, there's no Hungarian partridges in that area anymore, and, uh, and, um, and being involved in that, I, well, one other thing was that uh, when we um, moved to these outposts like Shepherd Field and, uh, and Amarillo, uh, and, and Betty was allowed to, to go with me on these Army uh, assignments. And uh, so the first person we'd go to would be the local game warden. And we figured he'd know more about uh, the, um, uh, 
the country around there and the wildlife problems and things like that. And this was a, this turned out to be the, the best thing we ever did. Is, uh, the, uh, gave us ends to these ranches, which, uh, which, which are hard to get into in, in Texas. Uh, the, uh, uh, but with uh, traveling with the game warden on weekends when I, had, when I was off duty, uh, I got to see an awful lot of, of Texas from that standpoint and be able to hunt and fish on places I ordinarily wouldn't have had access to and, and see places. And, uh, and that, in combination of my army job of, of visiting all these ranches, uh, gave me a chance to get better acquainted with areas like around Amarillo than I was in many places that I'd, I'd worked before. So it, it was a turned out to be a real good combination. And actually, I, I did did have an article, uh, "Birds of the West Texas" or something like that, was published as a result of this. Mm -hmm data I was collecting as uh, I made the rounds and, and then I remember when we went to Amarillo we got uh, again we were uh, we, we lived off the post and uh, the uh, our landlord was uh, had a had a couple of ranches near uh, near Amarillo so we got out to some of them and got to see for one thing one of these big uh, efforts to eliminate prairie dogs so we, we we uh, got a first-hand look at uh, how they did that on a huge scale, and it was, uh, uh, of course, at the time, prairie dogs were pretty numerous, and there were there was thought to be that they were interfering with the army or the the country's uh, food production, you know, and all that sort of thing. And uh, so, anyway, that was a uh, thing we got acquainted with. And, I remember one one uh, one occasion. They they were really good to service people in in West Texas. The uh, and we get invited to uh, maybe to uh, fish on somebody's uh, uh, stock ponds. And I remember one time we uh, a group of us uh, had a chance to fish uh, for bass in one of these stock ponds. Uh, very good bass fishing, and we caught a mess of uh, bass. And on the way home we stopped in at a restaurant and somebody got the idea that it would be nice if we had those fish when we had them with us. And uh, so we, uh, this was in Shamrock, Texas, I remember the place. We, we uh, asked the, the uh, uh, restaurant owner if, he, uh, if we could possibly get our fish cooked there and he said sure. And, uh, so anyway, they cooked up the fish and they brought them to us and all the things that went with fish. and. Uh, so after we got done, we asked him how much it'd be. So well, that's nothing. And so they, it was an example of um, how, how good they were to some of the service people around there. And, and uh, another tie-in was some some of our my career work was that uh, uh, when we were at Amarillo, uh, they they learned about uh, what I had been involved in and in, uh, in the past, and uh, uh, they had a, a, a a club, a uh, outdoor club, mainly for hunting and fishing, uh, at Paladero Canyon, which was uh, not far from Amarillo, and so they, uh, in exchange for some information on types of management they might get involved in, and so on, they gave us a key to their place, and so we had a chance to uh, on weekends to go out there, and that was a pretty nice one that we had. To, um, very nice uh, combination of uh, you know, fishing and that sort of thing. And so so we, there were some really nice uh, nice things that went along with the military career that, uh, that uh, wouldn't have been there if it hadn't been for the type of activity I'd been in before that. Um, Well, let's see. Well, one of the things I did uh, down when I was in Texas was uh, to um, I did some duck banding down there. Uh, there was a place right close to where we lived. We lived at the edge of Amarillo, and within uh, just a very short distance, there was a ranch that had some playa lakes on it, some wetlands on it that uh, uh, used to gather a lot of ducks in the years that there was good good uh, water conditions and. Uh, 
So we, this fellow that, uh, this editor I mentioned, Gene Howe, the, uh, uh, anyway, he, he agreed to supply the, um, the, the uh, things like to, to build a duck trap with. And so we built a little duck trap and, uh, and the rancher where we, we uh, <coughs> were going to do our trapping had uh, uh, sire and the millet, he, he grew uh, uh, sorghum in, uh, in his field and he uh, said we were welcome to help ourselves to any sorghum heads that were left after the harvest. Mm -hmm. So we used that for bait and we just stick up the sorghum and leading them into the trap that way. And I, I know that one fall I think we banded over 700 ducks with, uh, just in the sort of a recreational type thing and I always thought that that was the well, the least expensive duck banding operation <laughs> in the country. I think we figured it probably cost about a nickel per duck banded or something like that. Uh, so anyway, that takes us through the, uh, the, the military service and uh, um, after the war was over, uh, we went back to the Illinois Natural History Survey, but then I had some other, um, by that time, I had decided that I wanted to work with ducks and I wanted to do it up in Canada, if possible. So I had an opportunity to join the Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, so, and they were willing to pay more than I was getting from the Illinois Natural History Survey at that time. So I, uh, that was the point at which I joined the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and uh, I could be stationed at Madison, which was another plus, and all the Leopold had offered office uh, space for free if, uh, if I had office with him. So in exchange for that, I would uh, uh, take his classes occasionally uh, when he was called away or something of that nature. and. Uh, and work with some of his uh, grad students that were with waterfowl. And uh, so it was a, a really a nice arrangement. And then almost immediately uh, we uh, went to Canada where I was uh, uh, worked on uh, the activities up there, the, uh, the surveys that uh, for waterfall numbers and, uh, and then later with the banding and that sort of thing. And so. Uh, Betty and, uh, let's see, we didn't have any family yet, did we? Oh yeah, we had tech, techs by that time. So we all bundled up uh, with about, uh, within a week or two after I joined the service, and we took off for Canada. And uh, from then on, we spent um, eight years in a row uh, based at Delta. And, uh, uh, and then I worked out of there over mostly in Manitoba, although times I worked the whole prairie area and, uh, and we were there from uh, April after that first year I didn't join the service until May of that first year but after that it was we'd go up there in April and uh, come back in October so uh, Tex actually went to school in Canada some of, some of in his early years and in fact he I think he went along to the Boy Scouts up there and so on and so he didn't know whether he was a U.S. citizen or Canadian, I guess, at that time, because we spent uh, so much of our time up in Canada. But uh, um, so that uh, that went on for for eight years during that period, and then I uh, I, I came back. Uh, I was offered the job of uh, assistant uh, in management enforcement. They had the two branches of the service were together at that time, and. Uh, Flick Davis was the uh, was the supervisor, and, and I was assistant to Flick on the, the management part of management and enforcement. And uh, so we, uh, the, uh, at that time, there was a there was a close working relationship between the two. The the uh, uh, enforcement people just took them up to Canada to work on surveys and banding assignments, things of that sort, and uh, and then. Uh, I, in turn, as a management part, would uh, sometimes do some of the field work with the enforcement people. And so it was, I, I always thought it was a mistake when they got away from that deal. It was kind of a good arrangement, I always thought. But of course, the, 
the uh, enforcement people of today have a lot more things to worry about than they did in those days. They, they've, got, they've spread them out so much with new types of assignments that uh, they're more busy where they are. But when you got the supervi the assistant supervisor job, was that here in the Twin Cities? Yes, uh, that, that was at Region 3. Okay. Uh, but that, that didn't last too long before I had a chance to become, um, uh, 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 well, there was a Mississippi Flyer representative is what they call the, the, the job. There was one on each flyway. And uh, and our job was to uh, uh, go to all the flyway meetings and uh, to work with with state the the waterfowl people of each state of the flyway we were in on projects that uh, uh, were more of a, a broader scope than a than a state project uh, one that might take uh, uh, state personnel up to Canada to help out on banding or surveys or to uh, go to places to uh, analyze wing collections, you know, things of that sort. And uh, so that was our job, to work closely with the research people of each state on waterfowl type research projects, as well as to uh, work with the flyway councils and uh, uh, any activities that were at that broad fly on flyway scale. So, and that, uh, that was right at the very beginning of the flyaway type management, and so that was my job for the whole <coughs> rest of my time. I was with the service. I, uh, I think the next uh, 20 years I was on that job or something like that. And, and the person that uh, followed me, uh, he's still on it. So, was, so there's only been two people in that, that job in all that time, which is a kind of a unique uh, thing in the service and uh, uh, it's, it's been true in the other flyways too that uh, uh, the person on that job has been lucky enough not to be moved around a lot like most, most of the jobs uh, in refuges and enforcement. They like to move them around to give them an experience in different areas but uh, uh, we, we could base at a place that had facilities like where we could fly out you know and and cover the area just about as well from from uh, one place as another, you know. And so that was uh, that was why we were able to move here 45 years ago and still still be here. <laughs> so um, anyway, that uh, does that kind of summarize. Well, it doesn't tell about when we got when we got married. Uh, it was uh, uh, I mentioned that Betty Betty was. Uh, uh, her grandfather was the person who kind of organized Sable Grove, and uh, so I got acquainted with her there, and, uh, and uh, we got married out at uh, Rothfish Prairie, which was uh, uh, an area that was part of the Fable Grove area. Uh, it was a native wet prairie, and um, at that time it was uh, one of the finest wet prairies in Wisconsin. Max Parch did, did uh, a lot of his work there. He had a long stretch of 50 years that he spent together data on this one prairie. And um, anyway, um, uh, during the war years, um, the nag teacher at the high school in the, at, at uh, Lake Mills, which, which is right at Table Grove, uh, he and uh, one of the bankers decided that the prairie would make a great cornfield. And uh, so they uh, they got in there and dug some ditches and um, um, and pretty quick they um, had taken over the greater part of the prairie uh, with their agricultural developments. Uh, but uh, one piece of it was was saved, and that was um, that was named the Fable Prairie after after our grandfather Fable uh, Stoughton Fable. Uh, there was, uh, that was an interesting case in itself, and uh, Bob McCabe has written up the whole, uh, did, you, did you ever see that? Uh, anyway, he's written a little uh, a story of that. Uh, all the Leopold was, did everything in his power to try to save that from being developed. Uh, by that time, the University Arboretum was, uh, was in progress, and uh, so he was 
he wanted to put that under the university arboretum setup. It's sort of like the scientific natural area program. And uh, uh, so there was a, he worked uh, with a, uh, a lawyer in, in uh, Lake Mills who was also interested in having this become uh, uh, a natural area. And he did everything in his part to cooperate on the thing. And there was a willing sellers. Everything was just right, except there was no money. Uh, there was, they could not find any money. Uh, the asking price for the prairie was was seventeen dollars and fifty cents per acre, I think it was. And, and nowhere could they find any money until finally uh, a party came along. Uh, names was Miles, um, Philip Miles, uh, that um, uh, bought up uh, one. 60-acre parcel, I think it was, and uh, so that was that was about all that was left of the original prairie. It had uh, white fringed orchids and things of that sort, and uh, rattlesnake master. And it was really a nice prairie. It had, uh, as, as Max Parks has pointed out in his study of it, and uh, so that much was saved. And uh, so last year uh, was our. 58th wedding anniversary, and so we we got married on the prairie, and we went out. Uh, we staggered out to the where we'd been married uh, on a hot hot day, uh, and uh, it was about 90. I remember, and by that time the Andropogans were shoulder high, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, we finally got out there all right and got back again <laughs> in one piece. And, uh, so we celebrated our. 58th, wasn't it? 58th anniversary was out on, where we got married out on the prairie. <laughs> it's um, that one little piece has been was was damaged by by all these ditches, of course. But now they're trying to restore them. Uh, the, uh, her brother uh, bought uh, a piece of land right adjacent to the prairie after uh, uh, he was a teacher in Milwaukee, and uh, and after he retired, he he was able to buy this one. Uh, what is it, 60, isn't it? 60 acres? Yeah, right adjacent to to the prairie. And uh, Madison Audubon is, uh, uh, bought it from him. He gave, it was a matter of, uh, he, it was a pretty good deal for them too. Anyway, and, and they're restoring it. Uh, they're, it's been, uh, when Dave bought it, he, uh, I, he stated that he would, uh, uh, he would like to see it return to Prairie, but he wanted to recover the money he'd spent uh, and, and, uh, for it in the first place. And as soon as he did that, then he was going to turn it over to somebody to become a, a Prairie. And uh, so that was done just last year. And uh, so Madison Audubon uh, uh, restored the, blocked the ditches that had been put in, knocked down all the cottonwoods that were that big by that time, you know. And uh, they did a tremendous amount of work, volunt all volunteer work. And, uh, and uh, last fall they they introduced uh, local seeds and uh, and planted up the area. And uh, so that'll be an interesting area to to watch and see if it uh, if in time it will recover and become part of the the old prairie. And uh, what it uh, and there's some some other. Uh, prairie activities in that general area, so that in some ways that's the best it's been since the, the uh, 30s. When I was there, uh, there were still prairie chickens there, and uh, uh, we, uh, and they, they you know, lasted for another, I think they gave out, and uh, McCabe writes about it, in the early 40s, uh, they, the flock that was there uh, went down pretty fast after they started draining it and all that sort of thing. But uh, there were still little chickens. That was one of our activities when I was manager of the area was to uh, set up a chicken blind out there and then take groups out. And most of the local farmers had never, they'd heard them all their lives, you know, and they'd never seen the, the activities. And, uh, and that, this became a very popular thing around there. All the, we take out groups in the early morning and uh, to the booming ground and, uh, and that was, uh, uh, that was 
one thing that kind of brought the farmers and others together too, you know, and the, and the sportsmen. But, um, so anyway, um, so we go on to the next uh, what, Yeah, we'll just get a little more fit and we talked a little bit about family and when you got married, but just, you know, I know some of your children and oh, what they're yeah. doing, but just a little bit about your children and whether or not they're involved with Oh, with well. this kind of careers and activities. <laughs> okay, we we have uh, uh, three children. Uh, our son Tex um, works for the Fish and Wildlife Service now on watershed management projects, and uh, he's um, very much involved in um, an international program now too that has this uh, international program with regard to wetlands. He's on the on uh, the research committee of that of that group and uh, in fact next uh, next week I believe it is he's uh, connecting up with his committee in Switzerland and uh, uh, so he's, he's very much tied into the same type of work that, that I was except that he's working with more with land problems rather than species problems and our daughter is with the Forest Service uh, she's uh, she's up in the Boundary Waters uh, area a ranger up there and uh, uh, she's been with them for over years now. Her husband also is with the Forest Service, and they're both uh, they work in different districts of the Boundary Waters of the Superior National Forest. And both of them are in the Boundary Waters part of it. But most of their their field time is out in the field, and, and they probably know their districts of the Boundary Waters as well as any. Of course, uh, the problem now is with all that blowdown they're having. Uh, Problems they never imagined until, until now. And our other daughter lives uh, on the on our farm here. We live on a uh, an old dairy farm. Right? Uh, when we first moved here 45 years ago, uh, this was a dairy farm. They moved the cattle off, and we moved in. At that time, uh, we were in uh, the uh, outer ring of the development from the city, and uh, at, at that time we saw no immediate danger of city swallowing us up, but uh, it wasn't long before uh, they decided to put uh, this inter Interstate 35E right through our property and divided us in, in two, and, um, and didn't pay very well for having done it either, uh, we didn't think. But anyway, uh, uh, so we, we've gone through a, a, a big change since we've lived here in 45 years. Uh, this marsh that we live on here, which is 200 acres, it's called Lake Amelia, uh, was a cattail marsh. When it was, when it was, there was more cattail than there was marsh. The first time we saw it, it was on fire. Uh, somebody had touched the match at the north end on a, on a fall evening, and, uh, and it, was a, it was a really spectacular fire bearing down on uh, on our prop, what we have now is our property, but we hadn't even considered moving here at that time. But it was a, and the reason that it was a, a cattail, a dry cattail marsh was that there was an illegal ditch uh, that had been dug into it, into the, there's an aqueduct on the, the city water department, St. Paul Water Department, uh, had dug this aqueduct and we're back in the 1890s along the edge of the marsh and uh, the farmers uh, evidently pressed by a drought, I suppose, back in the, uh, the early part of the 1900s, had, uh, had dug into this aqueduct, and so that they're in the ditch connecting it from the marsh, so that it drained into the aqueduct, and by the end of summer, the marsh was practically bone dry, and uh, had grown up solidly to cattail. And uh, before that, it had been the um, people around here said that they used to be a prairie chicken marsh, and uh, the fish used to run up in there to spawn and that sort of thing. But it uh, it uh, uh, was a practically useless uh, marsh except for species that like dense cattail, <laughs> like the pheasants. And um, so one of the first things we did when we came here was to uh, uh, try to convince. Um, well, we didn't have any trouble convincing the state that it would be appropriate to put a ditch across, or a dam across the ditch and block it and restore the lake. And uh, 
Uh, that was a time when the uh, state was very much involved in the Save Our Wetland programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dick Dorr and people like that, that uh, uh, were, uh, Jim Kimball uh, was the director of the state at that time. And so they quickly sent out a crew out here to put a temporary dam from Carlos Avery, mm -hmm. Sandbag Dam. And uh, so it started to uh, be restored at that time. And about the same time, the uh, St. Paul Water Department decided that they didn't need this branch of the system because by then they had tapped into the Mississippi River. They had a different source of water that was much more dependable. And uh, so they put a valve where, where the aqueduct joined uh, another uh, branch from Centerville. And where the two uh, come together, this valve, when closed, serves as a dam. The, the state was going to put a, a, a permanent dam out here. They sent their engineers out and everything, designed it. But then they didn't need to once they, they put the valve in because with the valve closed, it was you know, everything a dam would do it too. And uh, so the, the marsh is now restored. And uh, we have uh, uh, put, put our land into a land trust uh, so that it won't be developed. And we're down to about a little over 50 acres now uh, from all the developments that have gone on around here. Uh, there's um, the highway took uh, about 20 acres right there, and uh, um, but then to finish up about our other our other uh, daughter is uh, lives right on the place here. Uh, the, uh, she part of the farm has uh, been. To, uh, they, they build a, a home on, on our place here, and uh, so they, she has 10 acres from the farm, which is the requirement under the zoning that they have uh, that much. And, uh, and she's very much, uh, right now she works for Pheasants Forever, so she's kind of hooked into the uh, wildlife field too, although she never had any uh, particular training along that line. But she's also on the environmental uh, board of the city. Plus, he's been very active in that line of work. So, so you might say that our whole family is, is, has been very much involved in one way or another with with the same kind of a career that I had, or some branch of it. Well, I'll just take a couple minute break here and. How about another cup of coffee? Yeah. <laughs> you have been talking for a long time. Yeah, I got to have something to <laughs> wet my own whistle with. Or, I didn't read ahead of time. Yeah, we touched on some of it, but you know, I guess, you know, to me some of the interesting things is how it kind of wildlife well, management together, and the yeah. whole the whole field has changed since you've been involved with it because you've been pretty much involved with it since you know early on in the infancy and how it, how it's come around and you know, things like that. Some of the problems that you've seen in, in the wildlife field, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll get going okay. again now. This is going great. <clears throat> that was the most dangerous or frightening experience. I suppose it was when our, when our air, airplane had to go into, into Winnipeg on one engine and with all the fire trucks and everything standing by. <laughs> That must have been. Was that one of your survey planes? Yeah, it yeah. was on a widget, I guess it was, uh, conked out. And it didn't, it had single engine performance, but barely. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, if anything had happened to the other engine at the time, mm -hmm. it would have been, would have been too bad. When you were up at Delta, where one of the first people to start doing the aerial surveys, or were they doing those before you got Oh, there? no, um, that was, um, is this on now? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, well, the way we got started, the uh, way I got started was that um, um, Bob Smith was the flyway biologist for Mississippi Flyway, and uh, he, he uh, decided that much of his work should be done by airplane, and so he took uh, training and and flying, and uh, one of his first jobs, I recall, was to uh, chase the geese out of Horseshoe Lake and make them go down to Kentucky. <laughs> and uh, and I remember in 
and I flew with him when he had only had about uh, 30 hours of flying experience, and uh, and that was the the job. His assignment was to run the geese out of there. So we we rounded up a a, a big flock of geese, uh, I don't know, a couple thousand maybe or something like that, and and then he started to push them down, you know, flying back up and get and. Uh, as farther we got, the fewer geese we had in the bunch. And about the time we got to the Ohio River, we were down to about one, one goose or something like that. And, and uh, so that was the first uh, first experience I'd had in that kind of work in the in the air, and one of his first experiences too. But anyway, the uh, the idea was that uh, when I decided to go to the service, that I would take over his job on the ground. And he would be take the first airplane up to Canada, one of the first planes, which was a Stinson L-5 that was a hand-me-down from the military. It was an observation plan, plane in the, in the military. And uh, after the war was over, they had to, you know, all these surplus uh, uh, planes and so on. And they gave the, the uh, service uh, a, a couple of them. And so Bob took a plane up to Canada and I drove his car up to Canada and we met up at Delta and, uh, and set up base at Delta Station and worked with uh, with Al Hochbaum and Lyle Soles uh, toward trying to develop a, a system of inventory and waterfowl. That was our first job. And uh, the idea would be that you could cover so much ground with an airplane compared to on the ground. Could you work out a system whereby you can see a representative numbers of the birds and uh, and, and thereby expand your, your system. And so we would set up a specific transects and then uh, take, a, take a swath uh, an eighth of a mile on either side of the road, quarter mile wide, and see what you could see from a plane and then cover that same swath from the ground and then compare that. To, and then we tried that on the, with a canoe on the, on the marshes there too. And that, that's where Al Hopebaum and his group fitted in. And uh, then we would uh, compare what we could see and see whether it made, made sense or not. And uh, um, one, of the, one of the funniest experiences, you know, there's a place for that here too I see, uh, that I recall was that uh, um, at that time we had to keep all our notes. We had a, pad on our knee and we record what we saw and that gets uh, that gets pretty difficult to do when things are coming up pretty fast from a plane. So um, somebody uh, had heard about wire recorders and, and how that would be a uh, big help because you just uh, yak into the wire recorder and that'd have your information. So uh, somehow the service got hold of one and installed it in, in Bob Smith's plane. And uh, we took off on a long uh, transect over into Ontario, all the way into Ontario and back. And we flew for a couple hours or so. And when we got back to Delta, uh, he turned it on to play back what we recorded, and nothing came out. And uh, so Bob made a couple of appropriate remarks on under those circumstances. and. Uh, and that that played back loud and clear, but the, <laughs> but all the all the data was uh, nothing. Nothing came out of that. And then another time, I uh, um, one of the people that we worked with up there in the early years was Dave Spencer. Uh, he was um, he was one of the first people that had, had any training that I know of in, in statistics. And he'd um, he'd had a course at uh, I think it was Iowa State. Uh, isn't that where Snedecor was? It, uh, anyway, uh, the, the textbook at the time I remember was was Snedecor, and uh, he, he was uh, he had this training in statistics, and uh, so for the first time we were trying to apply statistics to our efforts to uh, try to reduce the ducks per square mile and species by and so on, and um, at that time we uh, our idea of getting random numbers with put numbers in a hat and pull them out of the hats, you know. And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that was how we uh, uh, started out with, uh, and we worked very closely with the Delta people on that. 
And, uh, and what I was going to tell you about this one experience with Dave Spencer, we, we started out uh, uh, on a trip with a, with a wire recorder in an airplane, and uh, we got uh, 100 miles down the line, and uh, the cabin started to smoke up. And uh, so he was a Navy pilot, and uh, uh, he said, stand, stand by with fire extinguisher. And I was in the crammed into the back seat of the very uncomfortable plane, the, the, this uh, L-5. And, uh, and so we landed at uh, one of the emergency fields up in Canada, which was very, very common during the war years. And uh, anyway, we put down and just determined that it was nothing serious. It was just a cross wire or some sort. And well, that was our first experiences in, uh, with, uh, with wire recorders and uh, before they even had any uh, the more modern uh, uh, devices for uh, recording your information. Uh, and that, that, of course, was a wonderful help when they had, had the smaller equipment that you could install and not a big box like the wire recorder was the original deal and very uh, undependable. Before we got the tape rolling again, we talked a little bit about your the low point in your career. We didn't have it going, so you just well, the low point was um, uh, I was uh, I was up in Canada um, in April, uh, and uh, that was in in '48, and uh, and uh, somebody found me up there. He gave me this telegram that told that Leopold had passed away. And uh, of course that was a that was a terrible blow. Uh, I had uh, uh, when we moved to uh, well two things about Leopold I met. Um, one was that um, his budget uh, during the first years that he was up at the head of this department of game management was uh, five thousand and something per year. And that included travel and other expenses, such as student expenses. And under that kind of a budget, he uh, he took me to the first North American Wildlife Conference in, in Washington in 1936. And we traveled by train. And uh, that was my first experience on a long trip uh, overnight on a train, I remember. And uh, But then when we, uh, we got there, uh, uh, that was the first time I realized how important he was nationally. Uh, always it had been on a local level, like on the meetings like a men's club or something like that. I heard him speak at meetings of that type. But, but then as soon as we got into this national meeting with all the important people in the wildlife field for the first time, that was the, the meeting, you remember the first one was the one that uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt had called. Uh, and, uh, so there I saw that uh, everybody looked up to him as, uh, as uh, being the, the top person uh, at, at that time. And uh, so that was, uh, that was an eye-opener to me that, uh, that he ranked so high because he'd been, always been so available for, for little things. Like I remember one time in, uh, in uh, Wisconsin, uh, Getting toward the end, this was in the, you know, just a month or two before he he, he died. Uh, he had been invited to come out to, to Lake Mills to talk to the men's club, and of course he was involved in all this stuff nationally, you know. And uh, yet he and he was in poor health at that time. He was, by that time he was having his problems with his face and so on, and uh, and yet he. He took the time to come out to talk to the men's club, and uh, and then after that was over, he he, um, he went out to Betty's place, where his grandfather was, or where her grandfather was, and uh, and just had a, a relaxing time, uh, just t talking to Grandpa Fable, and, uh, and he took uh, Jerry Malaher, who was the director of Manitoba at that time. He brought him along. He was Jerry was here to visit and then uh, the, the North American uh, was going to follow within the next week or so at St. Louis. So it was, uh, uh, he was, uh, Leopold was supposed to go to St. Louis to be a, one of the main speakers down there. 
Uh, but um, anyway, they, they they came out to Fable Grove that night and uh, just sat around the the fireplace and shooting the breeze. He, he brought one of his commissioners. He, he was on the Wisconsin Commission by that time too. And, uh, so he brought one of the other commissioners and this other commissioner, his name was Clarence Searles, um, one of his great, uh, great passions was to uh, go out on a, a snowy night and try to call wolves. And uh, so he put on a demonstration right, right there in the living room there, you know, about uh, howling like a wolf, how he uh, tried to call him up, he'd go out on snowshoes, you know. And, and uh, so he went on a demonstration and uh, I remember what a, what a kick everybody got out of that. And, uh, and Leopold was really, uh, he was, uh, he just was as, as happy as I'd seen him for a long time that night, and, uh, uh, and this was only uh, the next uh, three or four days they were supposed to go to this meeting in St. Louis, and he declined to, to go uh, because his, his health was that poor, and uh, Bob McCabe gave his talk down there that year, and uh, so anyway, uh, uh, but I, I thought that was uh, that was really something unusual to to go to a, a men's club uh, just because um, he was concerned about how, how that uh, how his field station was was going. You know, and he did everything uh, he could to um, uh, work closely with with the people out in the field and you know the local townspeople to try to get them interested in the whole program and. Uh, um, Anyway, that, that was that was some of the and, and he used to whenever he make a a trip out to Fable Grove, uh, all the farmers there there were ten farmers involved in this this their cooperative deal and uh, and they all loved to have him come out and uh, he'd sit down and talk to them maybe they were milking the cows or whatever you know and and he was good at talking their language as well as uh, you know, being on a president's committee or something like that, you know, he was he was uh, very very good that way. And uh, well, the other thing I was going to mention was that when he uh, when I went to Illinois and the National History Survey, uh, we we worked pretty well all around the state. And uh, the place that Leopold used to hunt was right on the on the Illinois side, right across from Burlington, at the Crystal Lake Club. And, uh, and all, like uh, some of his early, well, his early hunting experiences with his dad and others uh, were, were uh, in this area in Illinois. And his brother was still a member of it. And in, in fact, he was in charge of the, uh, the wildlife program on it. And uh, so he, he helped uh, arrange it so that the Illinois Natural History Survey was, had some studies going on in this area. And, uh, uh, one of them had, it was in fisheries and another was in uh, oh, putting out food plantings for pheasants and things of that sort. And uh, uh, then uh, we got him interested, Frank Belrose and I got him interested in uh, uh, putting a wood duck nesting box unit there too, uh, and out in the bottomlands. And, uh, and one day, uh, well, I, I, I should back up a little bit. When we first went to Illinois, uh, all the Leopold insisted that I meet his family over in Burlington, and uh, so on one of the trips uh, over to the, the club area, uh, I went over to Burlington and, and uh, started to get acquainted with his brother, and, and from then on, uh, his brother and I were uh, hunted together and everything uh, over the next few years, and uh, uh, so I got well acquainted with his mother, who was still alive, and uh, his uh, Older, Aldo was the oldest in the family, but this sister Marie was uh, next, and uh, she was in her 90s at the time, I remember. And, uh, and uh, she, uh, well, no, she wasn't in her 90s at that time, it was somewhere along the line after <laughs> she couldn't have been in because he wasn't that old. But anyway, uh, uh, I got acquainted with the family at that way, and, uh, and that relationship uh, still kind of holds up today with, uh, with, uh, with Nina and uh, uh, people over in, uh, in uh, Stella and some of the others that uh, would keep in contact.
not that good. And, uh, and, uh, but um, anyway, uh, it was at that time that um, his brother Frederick uh, got uh, uh, interested in wood ducks, and uh, Frederick uh, became a, a real authority on wood ducks, and, uh, and he was recognized at the uh, wood duck uh, symposium held in St. Louis, which was the second second uh, international meeting on wood ducks. Uh, he and Frank Bellrose. Uh, were, were named as uh, uh, given a special honor for the, uh, that meeting, and, and Frederick became. Uh, he, he would have been very much like uh, like Aldo if he'd gone into that area. Instead of that, he he took over the, with his brother took over the family business, and uh, but uh, he had that same kind of a mind that, that Aldo did, and was was very scientific and. The way he went about things, and uh, when he would go quail hunting, he was a good shot. All the Leopolds were good shots. <coughs> and uh, after the hunt, if it was for doves or whatever, or, or quail, uh, he'd take the gizzard out and save the gizzard contents and that sort of thing. For and uh, he kept track of a uh, number of his average uh, and, and shooting whether and he. Like two shells per per game or quail or something like that. You know, he kept track of, of things of that sort, and uh, and uh, over the years he he became a a real authority on uh, on wood ducks, and uh, I think all of his records are in in Cornell now. I think he gave gave his records to Cornell, but he also was very much interested in uh, in plants and. Uh, their yard in, uh, in Burlington, the last time we visited was in the spring, is just a, a mat of wildflowers on that. They, they didn't believe in mowing his lawn and that sort of thing. Yet wildflowers growing all through the, the place. And, uh, but um, anyway, it's uh, it a very, very interesting family to, to, to know. Uh, you can understand a little more about why Aldo was like he was. Uh, it was just a... Uh, uh, well, I guess one thing, it kind of, it's uh, sometimes hard to, you know, it's easier to talk about other people, but what kind of are, do you feel are your most significant contributions to wildlife, into wildlife management fields? My most significant, I didn't make any. <laughs> well, I suppose the most significant was the, uh, the development of this uh, census technique for measuring waterfowl numbers. Uh, that was, uh, I think we were, Bob Smith and I were maybe the first to publish on it and back in, uh, after one year working with, with Della on some of these techniques I mentioned, uh, we reported that the North American Wildlife Conference of 48, I think it was. Uh, so there's a paper there somewhere that tells about that technique, and it really hasn't changed much since then. It's, uh, it's uh, generally uh, based on identifying ducks per square mile and then from the air, and then uh, correcting that figure by uh, a sampling of, of ground to, to tie in with, with the aerial counts. Uh, because you know you don't see them all from the air, mm -hmm. and uh, it varies with species. You, you maybe you see uh, half the half the mallards, but only one out of 14 green-winged teal, or something like that. So you, you, uh, we actually have a system of uh, of of, uh, of certain transects that you, you get both information and get a ratio between the two, and this sort of cricks for. Uh, individual differences in the ability to identify too because uh, uh, you know, all observers aren't the same either and so, so anyway uh, so I guess that maybe that would be a, 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 a most important contribution uh, we uh, we had uh, I think we were among the first to uh, some of the wood duck type thing Frank Bellrose and I uh, developed all uh, well, the nesting box, you know, and a few things like that. But, uh, uh, well, I, I 
I guess uh, all things considered, I guess I haven't done, I haven't contributed. To it. <laughs> well, those are two pretty significant things in what people consider everyday items nowadays. I guess lastly, you know, just what some thoughts on the future of wildlife and natural resource management. How are we doing, and where? <laughs> well. Of course, I'm. I'm. Um, I guess my biggest concern is uh, is population, human population uh, growth, and uh, and climate change. Probably those two things which could uh, change everything. You know, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I think too much, too little attention is uh, being given to both of them. And uh, uh, and someday it. Uh, that's going to be the limiting factor of progress in, in wildlife work, too. I, uh, sometimes maybe, maybe uh, uh, seems like we're developing uh, uh, wildlife professionals at an awful rate. I don't know how they can, I guess they're being absorbed all right, but it just seems like they're, they're there's so many schools now that are handling so many students, which is probably good. It gives them that, that kind of a background. But are there going to be slots for them as a, as a, you know, as a professional field? I, I guess maybe that's a question we ought to throw over here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess I'd like to really thank you for giving us your afternoon and well, uh, educating me a lot on the history of what. Uh, We'll probably think of a lot of things after we... Oh, the last one? Yeah. The last one? What would you do all differently? Oh. Oh, thoughts on the future. Oh. This is a new one. Oh, the, the photos in the... What would you do differently? Oh, okay. Um, if you if you had the, the chance to go back to... 1938. Whenever you're standing in Cornell, you, know, you, mm -hmm. you said that that was a good, good decision to, to go to Madison. But would there be anything you would do differently in your your career now, having gone through it all and had a few years to think about it after retirement? What you? Well, not not really. I don't think the. Uh, I, I think I've. Uh, I've just been lucky all the way through. I, I had, you know, I had no idea when I went to Cornell that they were outstanding in mm -hmm. field biology, for example. Just happened to go there, and uh, it worked out. And uh, and certainly the biggest turning uh, turning point was uh, when I had a chance to go to Leopold, and I could have gone in the other direction, and uh, my whole career would have been different somehow. <laughs> or if I'd stayed with fisheries, it would have been different too. And uh, so. I think so much depends on just lucky circumstances that, uh, that have come along, and, uh, and you either uh, either they work out for you or they don't. I, and uh, the, the, those those uh, certainly have gone the way I, I wouldn't I wouldn't change a thing if I were to have the ability, <laughs> the power to change it. I don't think. Then there's one last question here. I'll ask you. And one individual you've already talked about quite a bit, and we understand your, the influence of Alan Leopold, but in your opinion, who besides Leopold have been most influential in, in shaping the field of wildlife management? Well, I don't know about it, or shaping me or shaping Well, just the, the you know, development of the whole field. And well, I think in my case, uh, um, Bill Hamilton was a very okay. important person. Um, I, I um, well, I kept I kept t contact with him right up to the end. In fact, right up, up to the time he he died, I was and and he was um, he was uh, he had a lot to do with uh, on my thinking and and uh, <laughs> the good thing I didn't follow some of his his uh, idiosyncrasies though. <laughs> Because he he was uh, he was uh, one of uh, one of the hundred, but uh, but that that whole set of circumstances that um, at Cornell had a, like uh, Doc Allen had a lot of effect on me with all the 
the field trips and everything that we were involved in, and uh, the um, um, and then before that, this uh, friend I mentioned that was a was a taxon or a taxidermist, and then before that, this lady that was on my paper route that uh, and uh, um, these were all all uh, very important people in uh, in changing or in, uh, in my, what I what I finally got into, mm -hmm. and uh, it was not uh, it was not a like it is in many cases. It wasn't like uh, your family was uh, oriented in that direction, and and so you went that way because my my dad did. And uh, mother never. And my mother was always interested in flowers, mm -hmm. and uh, and was very tolerant of what I did, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, but um, but never uh, ever had uh, you know a direct a direct influence uh, from their own experiences or mm -hmm. anything like that. But her family's uh, had been farmers, and uh, uh, and so there was a lot of that kind of connection to the land that, uh, that went through the family strain. And then uh, my grandfather, I, I kind of suspected from some of the stories that he told me, was possibly a bit of a poacher over in England when he, when he was there. Because he was, uh, he, was, he, was a, he was a seaman part of the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that had nothing to do with my career, certainly. Yeah, I, th I was thinking a little more on, you know, of your colleagues who, you know, who would have had the most influence in bringing up the career. You know, somebody like Frank Belrose or Al Hockbun or yeah. who else was out well, there? Well, Bob that? Smith has been okay. another one that's been very close to, and uh, we're very close with Bob still. Mm -hmm. He's uh, he's 92 now, and we're going out to see him this summer, and we we even uh, talk to him every kind of. Sunday every Sunday, a weekly basis, and uh, and uh, Bob uh, was the one that talked me into going to the Fish and Wildlife Service to start with. And, and then there's been a lot of people along the line. There, uh, Gus Swanson was uh, was the uh, uh, our chief of, of research at the Fish and Wildlife Service when when I was hired, and I suspect he had some influence. And and uh, I've known Gus since the days that I was with. Well, Leopold, we made a field trip up here one time, uh, some of the grad students, mm -hmm. uh, just to meet Gus and, and, and Ralph King and some of the people that were around here at that time. And uh, um, but uh, well, it, it just one of the, one of the interesting things was, uh, or uh, coincidence, this was uh, that one of my customers. Um, on my paper route uh, was named Brumstead, and uh, they, they had the um, uh, haberdashery in town there. And, uh, and on New Year's, uh, the uh, news carriers used to go around and give out calendars, and you get, get a little uh, token, uh, uh, well, a little money to, for each time. Uh, those days. Uh, more like 10 cents, 25 cents. Uh, I had three customers that gave a dollar. One of those were, <laughs> and it all added up to about uh, $25 uh, for the for all the gifts that you got that way. And uh, and then the January sale would come along, and uh, and my mother would blow all the, all that on, on my clothes for the, and, and you buy a lot of clothes for $25. In those but anyway, uh, this this uh, Brumstead was one of my first customers, and. Uh, and uh, it turned out that Harlan Brumstead went to Cornell and became the, uh, well, I forget what his title was, but anyway, uh, he finally put out a, uh, edited a book on uh, Voices of Connecticut Hill. Have you ever seen that? Anyway, it, uh, all of the people that um, worked on, uh, on the grouse survey on Connecticut Hill were invited to uh, submit uh, their story of when you worked when you worked on that project and you put it all together in a book and uh, so uh, it's called Voices of Connecticut Hill and so it's got a lot of that history. Uh, another place that you if you haven't seen that there's a, a video that the Fish and Wildlife Service put out this last time that um, 
It's got a historical, con it, it has the, uh, uh, annually they put out this thing for the flyway meetings is one of the, the surveys that conducted in the waterfall situation. And this, this last one, the, the 99, they got a, a piece at the beginning and a piece at the end of the, of the tape on the history of the thing. And, uh, and they, they had me interviewed in that one, and, uh, uh, and then they've got a number of the original people that were involved there, like, uh, you know, Clarence Scottham and uh, quite a, uh, a whole lot of the early people that were involved in that work. And uh, if you haven't seen that, that uh, tape, uh, you might be interested in it sometime. I've got a copy of it here, and, uh, and that, uh, that gets into the history a little bit of just what I've told you here. And, uh, and uh, let's see what else. Uh, and well, recently, this last uh, year particularly, I've been involved in this uh, in the uh, 50th anniversary of the San County Almanac. Uh, I've participated in several of the conferences, and uh, they had a big one in Madison last fall. And then before that, they had uh, they had one in Shepherdstown, which is the National Conservation Training Center for now, uh, and I, I participated in that one, which was a training course for middle managers of, of uh, in all the land use agencies, BLM, Park Service, Forest Service, were all involved, and uh, so I gave a paper to that group on uh, uh, the Leopold land ethic type thing. And uh, and then this this spring we went back to the same place, to Shepherdstown. Uh, a group that was involved in that meeting uh, tried to um, uh, consider how do you keep up the momentum from what was gained last year? Uh, how do you carry that into the future? So that was a, that was the subject of that meeting this year. That was in March of this year, and. Uh, and then I've been working with this uh, Leopold education project of the Pheasants Forever. Uh, they have these uh, training groups. Do you have some up your way? They've been up there. And uh, so I've, uh, they have an annual meeting at, uh, at Baraboo. Uh, well, this year it's going to be at, uh, at uh, Wisconsin Dells, I guess, but it, in which you go to the, spend part of the time at the shack there, you know, and uh, it's uh, uh, usually some of the, uh, Nina or Estelle or some, or some of the Leopold family are usually there. They have a seminar out at the shack and uh, usually have a, a guest speaker out there or something. And then they, they have these uh, trainees from previous workshops. It's kind of a refresher deal or a bit more advanced type of thing. They've had those for, this will be the fifth year now. And, uh, and that's in August for this year, I, I think. I'll, Probably be involved in that one. Then I've been down in uh, in Arizona this uh, this spring um, for a, a, they invited me to come down there to give from Leopold uh, land ethic type stuff. I've got a slideshow that goes with that, and, uh, and so I give a couple of talks down there and, and on that. And uh, so that's how I've been spent, spent uh, quite a bit of my time in the last uh, couple of years. And, and then, uh, uh, of course, I've been involved in this, uh, this heron thing that we've been <laughs> talking about, this mystery of the herons. And, and, uh, and then we, I'm a assistant wheat commissioner over here, or uh, just a call wheat commissioner over at North Oaks here, too. Oh. <laughs> Mostly on purple loose right. That's our thing there, mostly. Although I think. Uh, they probably should be more interested in leafy birds than they are. Too. Uh, beetles. Mm -hmm. Put beetles on. Knapweeds might. Knapweed oh, bugs are what I worked on now. Oh, are you, are you, do you have access to that?